So, okay, so this is about error handling. Fascinating topic, I'm sure. Uh, I was uh, very hopeful that this talk would be accept accepted for uh, PyCon, but it wasn't. Uh, but I had to prepare anyway because it, it's a topic that I find interesting. So, you know, why let it go to waste, right? Uh, so, very quickly, uh, I work uh, at SDVI with uh, Larry and uh, Jeff. And I wrote the O'Reilly book, Flask Web Develop Development, though this is not going to be about Flask. Mostly, I'm going to talk a little bit about Flask. Uh, can't help it. Uh, I wrote a, a bunch of uh, Python open source packages. I'm going to be talking about one of them here. Uh, I have my blog, which I write mostly about Flask. So you're welcome to visit, uh, visit it if, if you don't know it. And uh, there's a bunch of PyCon talks that I did in past years on YouTube. You're welcome to look for them. And I'm, I'm doing uh, an advanced Flask tutorial for PyCon. So if you, uh, if you think you, you might dig that, I'll be happy to, uh, to do this uh, in uh, end, of, uh, end of May, I think. So what is there to say, right? It sounds like a, like a silly topic, right? You get an error, you handle it, you move on. So if you Google this, error handling Python, you're going to find this. There are two approaches, right? And the, the thing that these two have in common is that they have uh, fairly unpronounceable acronyms, right? Some people laugh, so they know about it, right? So I'm going to talk about this, but, but this is only the beginning, right? What I'm most interested in, uh, in talking about is the kind of things that nobody discusses. So uh, what happens if instead of you getting an error from some function that you call, you are the originator? What do you do? How do you report the error to whoever calls you? Nobody says much about how, you know, what's the Pythonic way to do that? Uh, how to write code that is not a mess, or handling code that is not a mess? Uh, nobody talks much about that. Uh, how to keep the error handling code separate from your code, the, you know, the application logic, so that you, you don't have a mess where you have to, you know, skip, mentally skip the error handling code to see what your real code does. And another thing that's very important, if you're doing something for real, right, with paying customers, you have to have a strategy to run uh, production versus development, right? They're different. And, uh, you know, there, there's not much said about this, in my opinion. So I'm going to have to do this. This is obligatory. I have to tell you these two error approaches because you know, this is where I'm going to base everything else on. So sorry if you know them. Uh, so this is called look before you leap, LBYL. I'm not going to try to pronounce it, right? It doesn't work. So what this approach is saying is that if, if you need to do something, you have to check first that you know, the conditions are proper for that thing to work. So you check, and if the check says yes, then you go ahead and do it. And, you know, the principle says that then you're not going to have any errors, right? <clears throat> which in Python, it's, it's really unlikely true. This is actually an awful way to do errors. It, it's pretty popular in other languages, but uh, it, it's, it's kind of a mess. And one problem is that it's not always clear what you need to look if you don't know how that thing that you want to do works internally, I mean, what, what do you check for, right? So say, for example, you, you want to uh, create a file. Silly thing, right? So, okay, the logical thing to do would be to check that the file doesn't exist already, right? So you check that, and then you open the file. But uh, do you need to check if uh, your user has right permissions on the directory where the file is? Do you have to check if the disk is full or you have space? You know, it, it can get really out of control. I mean, you know, the number of things that you need to check, I mean, you can't possibly know them all, right? And in Python, when there's an error, most of the Python library functions uh, raise an exception. So, I mean, you're trying to avoid errors, and you're, you're going to get them anyway, right? If, I mean, if you don't check everything, which you can't, you know, when, when you call the do x or whatever it is, you, you may get an exception. So, it doesn't really work. Another really big problem with this is that uh, it, th there are potential race conditions, right? We all run in machines that can do multiple things at once. So 
you're looking to see if the environment is proper for the thing that you want to do. And then, you know, you, you take a little moment, right? The Python interpreter switches to the next line. There's a small amount of time between where you look and where you actually do the thing. So the environment can change, right? And if, if, you're, if you're doing something that's uh, heavily multi-threaded or multi-processed, I mean, chances are that eventually you're going to hit this. So you look, and then when you go do the thing, you know, if, if you were to look again, you will find that things changed. So another reason that this is really bad. And finally, this is not a, a good reason, but if you ask anybody, they'll say that this is not Pythonic. And, you know, we, we try to do things Pythonic ways. So, uh, you know, in general, you know, people tend to avoid this as much as possible, and I do too. So this is the second one. And this is even harder to pronounce. It's called, and, and to even say, right? It, it, it's an awful name. I, I don't know who makes these names, but anyway. Uh, easier to ask forgiveness than permission, E-A-F-P. So when, when you do things this way, you basically run the thing that you want to run and try to catch the errors, right? So, so you need to be prepared to catch the errors after. So, so the thing that you're doing will be the one reporting the errors to you. So. This is far better than the previous one. Uh, but like the previous one, you need to know what to expect, right? In, in the previous one, you, you had to know uh, what to check. On this one, you need to know what errors this thing that you want to do will raise, right? If, if there are any conditions. So you rely, for example, on uh, documentation. Right? You need, you need do doc good documentation to find out uh, the kind of things that you need to catch. And, uh, in case some of you do this, and, and I do sometimes, but very rare occasions, catching all exceptions in general, it's a really bad idea. Uh, that, that's how you miss bugs in your code. So, you know, th there are some cases where it might be a good idea uh, to do it, but almost never is, uh, very rarely is. So you, you have to know what errors to catch, and you need, you need to try to catch the least uh, scope of errors as possible to allow other errors to, you know, to be seen, right? Because I mean, those are bugs and you want to find them. Uh, this is maybe a little bit of personal opinion. If I look at these two, uh, looking from the point of view of uh, code readability, I will take the one on the left, you know, 100 times. I, I think that's way better than the exception code. Exception code, in my opinion, make things harder to parse by, by a human brain, uh, especially if you have more than one thing inside the try accept block. If you have, for example, if you have 10 lines inside, right? You, by, by looking at the code, you don't know all the, I mean, the, you, you could know, but there are too many ways in which the, the code could flow, right? Those 10 instructions, either one of them, any one of them could, could raise an exception. So how, how you know, it, it, it gets, you know, too complicated. Whereas the other one, it's, it's basically logic flow, you know, if, else, whatever. So from code readability point of view, I prefer the uh, LBYL. That, that's kind of crappy. So, you know, we, we have to deal with the, uh, the exception uh, syntax sometimes. <coughs> so, so now you know the two, right? That, that's it. I mean, mostly, if you, if you go look for error handling, that's what you're going to find. You're not going to find any, any more than that, more than likely. So neither one of these uh, two say how you, do you report errors, right? If, if, if you are the originator, if your code originates an error, how do you tell the caller, right? They don't say. They don't say, I, I mentioned this before, they don't say, uh, you know, what do you do in production? And I, I'm going to tell you what you should do. In production, you should have all errors handled at some level so that your application don't crash. You don't want customers to see a crash. Certainly not the, the Python crash where you, where you see stack traits, right? That, that gives out too much information and it looks unprofessional, right? So you, you, you don't want that. So your application should never crash. Uh, but but there, there might be errors, right? So what do you do with them? You send them to a log or you send them by email to yourself, right? Because you, you're away, right? This, this is running at a customer side. On the other side, there are development needs, right? I mean, the, the production needs are good for an installed application, but when, you, when you're developing, that gets in the way. 
So it's pretty much the reverse, right? You, you want all errors to be, you know, let, let be, right? You, you want ap the Python application to crash. If you're running uh, the Python application on the console, for example, you get a stack, a stack trace, and you can debug it. If you're running inside a debugger, like, uh, say, uh, PDB or PUDB, the one I like, uh, they, they have handling for exceptions. So you, it, they will help you debug the exception. If you're running Flask, sorry, I have to say it, you get a debugger on your browser when you get uh, an exception that it's allowed to go all the way up. Right? So, so you, you, you want to do that for the development. So you need to have an easy way to switch. And of course, uh, if, if you are in development, you want to see all the time, you want to see stack traces, right? Because those are what help you uh, find bugs. So the problem is that I don't like either one of these, right? <laughs> I don't like them. So sometimes there's no way around it, and you have to use one of these two, and I prefer the one on the right. But I'm going to show you the kind of error handling that I like. Right? I even gave it a four-letter acronym. <laughs> so this is what I like. Okay? And I'm, not, I'm not pulling your leg. Okay? This is not a joke. This is true. What I'm saying with this is that the error handling is not here. It's somewhere else. Right? I'm not saying there's no error handling. <clears throat> error handling is not here. Right? I don't want to see error handling as much as possible mixed with my code, the code that I work every day, okay? Does that make sense? Yes, it does, but you don't believe me that you can do this, right? <laughs> so the rest of the talk, I'm going to try to show you how you can do this, right? And, and you cannot always do it, but, but uh, a fair amount of times, you're going to find that you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing, and you, you can get to something that looks like this, where you have error handling somewhere else, and you don't have to see it every day. So, you know, that's the rest of the talk. So, first, I'm going to mention this. And this, this is important. Uh, many times people think that, you know, if, if you call anything that raises an error, you have to catch it or run it, try accept block. And it's, that, that's not true. So, there's a very important distinction between errors that you can recover from and errors that you cannot recover from. So, when you call a function or, or when you're in code that could error, you have to think, if I have an error here, can I recover from it? And my definition, this, this, is, this is all my, my stuff, right? I, I, I'm defining this as I go. So I'm going to say that if the function that has an error can continue, the error is recoverable. That, that's my definition of recoverable, recoverable error. And if the function, after that error, has nothing it can do that it, you know, it, things look so bad that you have to quit the function, end the function, then the error is not recoverable. So that, that's my definition. Now, there's an interesting property of unrecoverable errors. So let's say you, you have uh, you know, a stack of functions, you know, function A calls B and C and D, and you have a bunch of them. And the one at the very bottom finds an error. And that guy says, yeah, th this is not recoverable, so I I'm going to stop, right? So, so then control goes back one level, right? And now the error, it's in the hands of, of the guy who called the, you know, the bottom one. So now this function can say, can I handle this or not? No, OK. So it keeps going up. Eventually, you could find, you know, at some level, you're, you're, you're so up in the, you know, in the scope of your application that maybe you can handle the error. So it, it was an error that was uh, unrecoverable, but eventually, you know, keeps going up. Eventually, you, you can do something about it. So for example, you are in a, say, in a GUI application, right? Let's make a variety of examples. So this is a GUI application, and you, you, you're, doing, you're, you're doing file save, right? Saving a file. So, you know, function calls function calls function. Eventually, you're going to open a file and write some data on it. That fails. So the, the save function clearly cannot continue if there's no file. <laughs> Right, so, so unrecoverable, keeps going up. Eventually, it may reach the higher layers of the GUI, and you know, at that point, you can say, well, okay, fine, I could not save the file, so I'm gonna put a uh, message to, you know, to the user, and then go back to, you know, to, to run the application, let the user click other things on the menu, or whatever, right? So it becomes recoverable, right? Very important, it, I mean, I, I know many of you are saying, yeah, this is obvious, 
But I, I don't think we think you know, enough about this when, when you're writing error handling code. You have to think what kind of error you're dealing with. So let's see how you, so I, I'm gonna split this in four cases, right? So th this is you know, straight advice on how I think you should handle errors or how I do handle errors. So first case is when you are running in a function and you originate an error. So, so you, you find that the conditions in your function uh, lead to an error and you can recover from it. So what do you do? You recover, right? <laughs> you keep going. This is an easy case. And here's an example. Let's say this is a function that uh, adds a song to a database or something, right? So let's say uh, the, the caller provided a song with, with uh, a lot of data, but there's no year. You don't know the, the year the song was published. So you can say, well, year, I, I don't care, really, right? It's missing, so I'm gonna set it to unknown and keep going, right? So very simple. This is very readable code, no problems in my opinion. So you, you, you just keep going, right? So another situation with uh, recoverable errors comes up when you call a function, instead of you being the originator, you call a function and the, the other function returns an error. So it was unrecoverable for the other function, but, but you can recover from it. So in that case, and th this is the case that I don't like, because, because Python is so heavily centered on exceptions, the only way to keep going, right, if, if a function receives a, an exception and you need to continue on that function, is to, to do the try except lock, right? So, so this, this is ugly code, in my opinion. Uh, I always try to keep a uh, small number of lines inside a try except, so usually one or two, no, no more than that, to minimize the damage. But still, it bothers me that you know, that sole thing with the indentation, I, I don't like that. But in this case, I, I think there's no way around it. Okay. So let's look at unrecoverable errors now. So again, two cases. Uh, if if you originate, so, so you you you're running a function, and at some point you, you're checking stuff, and you find that you have some something that doesn't make sense, and the function cannot continue. So in that case, how what, you know, what do you do? How do you stop? And Probably, if you think about the options, the, the most common option would be return false. A lot of people do that, right? They, they return. And the problem is it, it's a really bad idea because you're forcing the caller of your function to check, right? You, you're forcing your views on how to handle errors into your caller. So the proper way would be to raise an exception, which is consistent with the uh, EAFP way of doing things, right? So. Uh, in this case, I'm, uh, I'm doing a customer validation, so val validating some data structure. And if I find that uh, this customer uh, doesn't have a name, so that, that's really, you know, I mean, customers need to have a name. So this application decides that that's unrecoverable. So you raise an error. Uh, so you, you can use one of the exceptions that come with Python. You can, in this case, I'm using a custom one. You can define your custom exceptions, which is nice because you, you can add a, uh, an error message that, that's meaningful, that the higher layers, when, when this error becomes recoverable, they can use that text to show to the user, right? It can be uh, a good thing that you show some content. So this is a way you handle uh, recovering from an error, uh, not, not recovering from an error, actually, that you uh, originate. Now, the most interesting case, this is the fourth case, is when you call a function, this is the most common one by far. Typically, you're running a function, you're doing something by calling some function, right? A database or a file function, you know, whatever, something. And that fails, and if that fails, you cannot continue. So this is, this is the one that people would not initially think it's the right thing. What you need to do here is nothing. Don't catch the error, let it go. We said that the error is unrecoverable, so this function cannot do anything you know, that helps you know, handle the error because it, it's unrecoverable. So say I'm, I'm writing, a, a, this is a function that writes a customer to the database. So I need to validate the customer and then write it to the database. These two functions are, uh, are based on this, this idea, right? If they find an error, they will raise. So what I do here is nothing. There's nothing I can do, right? 
I mean, all I want, if, if I get an error uh, of, of an invalid customer or a database error, I can't write the thing, right? So why bother? Just, just let it, OK? So this, this, this is the, the kind of errors that are the most common and the ones that I love because I don't see them, right? And I know I haven't explained how this works, right? I, you know, bear with me. That's coming, <laughs> okay? It's not a trick, okay? So, so you don't handle. You just let it go up. So let me show you. So that this will be a a typical thing that people do. That's wrong, right? So let's say th this is a song example. You're writing a song to a database. Th this is a, a Flask. I, I can help writing Flask examples, sorry, <laughs> right? So, so this is a Flask uh, API route that updates a song, right? So it's a put request. That doesn't matter, really. Uh, you can see that to write the song to the database, it's two lines, right? Add it to a database session and then commit the session. That's it. You can see in blue all the crazy stuff that you could do if, we, if, we, we, if you were doing things wrong, right? You can say, my God, if, if I write to SQL Alchemy and SQL Alchemy throws an error, what do I do? I'm going to catch the error. And what do I do if I catch the error? I'm going to write to the log. I'm going to say I had an error. And then you can say, well, now I have an error. I need to roll back the session. Oh my god, that, that could fail too. So what do I do? I'm going to catch the rollback error too. right? And what do I do if I have an error in the rollback? I'm going to write it to the log too. How useful is that? Not at all. right? It doesn't help anything. Uh, if, if you go look at your log, you're going to have these messages that probably in a year, you're going to copy paste into a lot of other places, right? So, so then you, you get an error in the log, and then you need to grab your code to find out, figure out where that error happened. It, it's really crazy. It doesn't help anything. So this is what you should do instead. This is how, how, how you do it for, uh, for real, OK? The errors are going to do the, their thing. So it's not your problem. And this is code that you work every day, so you don't want to see all that crap you know, in your, uh, your code. right? It complicates things. So I'm going to tell you how this works in Flask. I, I said this, right? The error will go up. No, nobody is you know, trying to stop that error, so it will keep going up. Eventually, it will reach the Flask layers. Okay? And Flask has an error handler that recovers errors. Flask is pretty good about this. Django too. So I, I, by no means I'm saying Flask is special. Right? This is no rocket science. So what Flask is going to do? Flask is going to write the stack trace of the error to the log. So Flask does that for you. So, so before you had a cannot write customer, you know, one line in the log. Now we have a full stack trace. So then Flask will say, OK, uh, so this is a failed request. I'm, I'm going to do cleanup. So it's going to call all these extensions and let them do cleanup. Among them, there's going to be Flask SQL Alchemy, right? the database extension. And SQL Alchemy will say, OK, I'm, I'm going to roll back the <laughs> exactly the same thing you're doing. right? I'm going to roll back the session. The, the thing failed. So exactly what you want. And then Flask is going to send a 500 error to the client, which is the normal thing to do. Right? So if you look at the, the, the other code, it was doing the same thing that Flask does automatically for you. Uh, but you know, your version didn't write the stack trace. And if, if you want, you can, but it will make the code even more complicated. And you know, for nothing, because you know, Flask does it all for you. So now you're thinking, right, yeah, you're using Flask. So, and you know Flask from A to Z, so that you, you, know, you know all this. But what happens if I don't use Flask? I, I don't use Django. I, I'm just running my own thing, uh, right? I mean, Flask. I mean, everybody knows that Flask is magic, right? So, uh, <laughs> how, how how do you do this? Really, it's very easy, and you probably know it. So here's an example, right? This is the wrong approach, right? I'm, I'm uh, this is customers again. So I'm I'm writing customers to the database, and I have a try accept block. Now, if if you think about this. The function save customer to DB, if it, let's say we, we do it this way and we, we get an exception, what do we do? If, if you're doing things the right way, this function doesn't know anything about the environment it's just running on. So print that error message to, to where? Standard output? Is this a command line 
application? Is, is this a GUI application? Is this a web application? That function should not know any of the things that are going on outside, right? That, that's the way you keep things clear and maintainable. So even if you do it this way, you, you wouldn't know how to handle the error, right? It, it's clearly unrecoverable for the function. So what do you do? You remove that from there, and you put it one level up, OK? So now I'm, I'm putting it in the, uh, so this is a very simple example. So I just moved it one level up. So now I'm, I'm putting the uh, try accept on the function when I call the function. So if the chances are you're going to be working a lot on your function, that the one that has your logic, and very little on the main block, right, which probably will, will not change very much. So you can, ha you, can, you, know, you can allow yourself to have ugly code in a place where you don't have to look very often. So that's the idea. Uh, now, the main block knows that it, it is a command line application. So it, it's allowed to say, you know, logger, write exception, or whatever, you know, whatever your logging mechanism is. Right? At this point, you do know that, you know, your, your environment. It, it's one of the, it's actually the highest uh, layers in your call stack. So it knows a lot of things. You could have something similar like this. Uh, if you have a GUI application, you, you will have it at some place. Uh, and same thing for a web application. In, in the strange case where you have a web framework that doesn't do this for you, I, I believe all of them do, but I mean, you, you could do it yourself this way, by just you know, moving the try except up, 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 until you cannot move it up anymore. Now, uh, there's an advantage of doing it here. Uh, remember I said that if, if you're running under production, you, you want your application to never crash. So the, the way you do that is you, you do a catch-all. This is one case where it does make sense to catch all exceptions, right? You are so high in the stack that any errors don't matter, right? At, I mean, at that point, things are so wrong that all you want to do is uh, you know, put the error out in a log so that then the developer can find a bug, right, and fix it. So you, you, you can do, at this point, you can do a uh, catch-all and write the exception to the log. And you can even say unexpected error, and in your log, you can find that this, this is a different uh, different error. You, you can change the messages, basically. That's what I'm saying. So uh, I remember uh, probably, I don't know, three, four weeks ago, I was writing this presentation, and I, I was right here. And I said, this is great, but that's still ugly. I, that, that doesn't look good. So it gave me an idea. And uh, this, is, this is one of the things I love about you know, preparing presentations. I always have ideas for doing things. So that idea ended up being a new Python package it's called Mary that uh, tries to help you doing this you know, so, so that you don't have to do it by hand like I just showed you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how that works when you use Mary. So you install it. It's a package. And then uh, you, you can have a separate module where you have your errors. And anybody who has seen my talks, uh, they, I mean, you, you know that I love decorators. So instead of doing the, the ugly try except block that messes your code and gets that saw thing with the indentation that I hate, here you, you can create uh, exception handlers as functions and uh, register them with different types of exceptions using a decorator. So you, you create a Mary object, and then from, from the Mary object, you can draw a decorator called accept. And, and then you can make, uh, in this case, I'm doing the two, the same two that in, in the example of the previous slide. One for the two errors that the, the, the customer functions throw in this example, and one catch all. Right? So, so that's errors.py, separate. I don't want to see it, far away. Now, my application, I just import the Mary object, and then I decorate my function with the try decorator, another decorator that you get from this thing. And that protects the entire function and catches all the errors and sends them to the proper error handler. So look at how, how very little glue there is in this one versus the previous one, right? So, so at, and, and then your main function is clean. So now, now your main function is clean, and your uh, actual logic is also clean, OK? So uh, I, I was very excited. I, I basically, I, I, I planned to, to work a Saturday afternoon, I think it was, on, on the presentation. And I, I threw away the presentation and ended up working on this. Uh, <laughs> Right, so uh, but, but you know I, I love it. it, it it's beautiful, and, and of course this is not something I invented. I, I'm not a genius. 
Uh, this is heavily based on how Flask does things, right, which is what I know. So it, it's not really magic again. And this is probably a couple pages of Python code. If you want to see how I implemented this, uh, you can look at it and, and learn if, if, if you're interested. It's really very simple, to be honest. <coughs> so remember I, I mentioned that the, uh, the ideal thing would be to handle errors differently when you are debugging or developing versus on a production deployment. So if, if you were doing things by hand, you will have to handle all of that yourself, right? You will have to have some sort of flag. And then in your accept, you know, the catch-all accept, for example, you will check and you will do log or you will do something, you know, depending on the mode. So with Mary, you, you do what I just showed you in the previous slide. And then if you put that, that flag that tells you if you're developing or uh, production, you put it in the constructor, that, that will change the way things work. So if you say debug, debug mode equals true, it will suspend all handling, and it will let all, bub all errors bubble up. So if you're debugging, they'll, they'll get all the way. If you're command line, you will get the stuck phrase as if you didn't have any error handling, which is what you want. You want to see the errors. For production mode, Mary has a logger object. So uh, it, it, it allocates a logger, a standard Python logging object. Uh, if you don't like that, you can provide your own. doesn't matter. Uh, and it will log the stack traces without you having to do a thing. So if, if you notice in my example handlers, uh, I'm not logging stack traces because Mary does it for me. I don't have to. Okay, I, I, I can print messages to the log. Or in, in this case, I'm putting them on the console, but if they could go to the log, the, uh, the stack traces of the exceptions will go. You don't have to worry about that. They're always going. Uh, they're going to be in the log. And then, as I showed you, you can do a catch-all, and th this prevents your application from crashing So for production. If you set debug mode equals true, this is not going to run. So they're going to get suspended, and you're going to get the, the errors uh, directly on your console or debugger or whatever it is you're, you're seeing your errors. So that, that's it. Um, I don't know if you have any questions. If, if, if I didn't convince you that this is a, a good way to handle errors, you're more than welcome to uh, ask questions. Uh, as a summary, I can tell you that uh, you know exceptions and uh, EAF, EAFP are the Pythonic way to handle errors. And the er sending error codes, God forbid, no, please. And the LBYL also, we, we don't like that in, uh, in Python. Uh, if your error is recoverable, you just recover it and move on. If the error is unrecoverable, unrecoverable you do nothing. You let it become recoverable higher in the stack. So that, that's the important thing. If you're developing, you want your application to crash as much as possible because those are bugs. You have to find them. If you catch the errors, you're not going to find them. You're not going to find out that you have an error. If you are running on a production deployment, you want the errors to not be lost, so they need to be sent to a log. Very important. And you should not crash, of course. Uh, Ideally, you want your error handlers to be at the highest scope levels, as, as high as you can in your call stack, so that they're separate from the logic that you need to work every day. You don't want to see error handling code unless you're working on error handling, which translates into this uh, next topic. So basically that, keep it separate. Right? It, it's a good principle to, to, uh, have, your, to have your code uh, remain uh, maintainable, readable, and uh, not crazy, right? So, so that you come back to it in a year and you still understand it. Finally, I would be more than happy for you guys to try Mary, which is, you know, it, it's like a baby project, uh, three weeks old or four weeks old. Uh, and uh, send your feedback. If you have ideas to make it better, uh, please uh, let me know and send pull requests. So there you go. That's it. Uh, and if I didn't convince you, I need to hear questions, please. I, I, I want to make sure that, uh, yes. Uh, you talked about the limit of uh, custom exceptions and messages that would be sensible to your end users, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So in the fourth case, um, where you do nothing, uh, it seems like you're trusting the function you call to produce exceptions that are 
helpful to the users? Or, or when is that? Uh, hold on. Uh, okay. Does that sense? No. Uh, so so this, that's the third case. I showed you four cases. The one that you're mentioning is the third case. That, that would be a case where you raise an exception. So you, you raise your own exception. This is your own error, right? So imagine that. Okay. Right, in that, well, in that so I'm, I guess I'm thinking of the fourth case, but you're saying don't put in a message, don't provide context information because you don't know enough about why it broke anyway? Right, I, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a thing that the developer will have to investigate, and for that you want the SQL Alchemy error. Um, I, 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 I guess I, I agree partly that it might be useful to, have, to show you know, a, a user-friendly message, Maybe, my experience, you know, it, it's not that useful. You, you can say something generic, like the, the operation failed or, you know, you know something like that. Uh, and, and that would be for GUI applications. If you are uh, using a web application, it will be a 500 error. So it's always going to be internal server error, internal service error. Uh, and command line, you know, you're going to say there was an error. Uh, one thing you can do is you can, you can raise two errors if you want. Uh, I mean, that, that would make the code a little bit more uh, complex. You're going to have to catch the SQL Alchemy error. So, so that, that ugly you know, page with all the, a lot of blue, right? You're going to have to do that and then uh, re-raise the SQL Alchemy error for the developer and then raise another error for, you know, for users, uh, may, maybe a, a custom exception that the higher levels recognize as something that has a message for the user. Yes. Um, I, I don't know how Mary works, but from what I saw of the decorators, it looks like uh, you can only really register one handler for any particular exception type. Correct. Um, right. So, so it's you're kind of. Uh, but you, you can have multiple Mary objects. Oh, okay. You, you don't have to have one. Right. Okay. okay. So you, you you can have different sets of exceptions for different functions. Okay. Um, do, do you tend to use it? Um, do you tend to use multiple objects, or do you just use it at the top level? Uh, so, well, when you work on a web application, as, as I said before, the errors that you provide to the user are really uh, 400 or 500. Really, it's very limited. So, uh, I typically work with one set of errors. So, uh, SQL Alchemy errors, th those type of errors, I don't care. Those are errors that you know stop the the request cycle and basically put the server into listening for the next request, doing cleanup. So it doesn't really matter, you know, what happens. I just want to log the, the more detailed error for me as a developer and then move on, basically clean up and be still responding to new requests. Uh, so, so one set of uh, errors in general works, works fine for me. Yes. Um, so from what I can tell, Mary helps you with um, the errors that you let bubble up to the top, does it provide anything for recovering recoverable errors? Oh, well, that's a very good question. I, I, I mean, I need help. I mean, if you can figure out how to do that, that, that would be a very good addition. Uh, so <laughs> the, the problem is that you, you, you want the function to continue, right? So you cannot exit the function. You cannot let the error bubble up because once it bubbled up one level, you know, that level where you want to continue is lost. Right, so it's unfortunate, and, and I, I hate it because yeah, I, I don't like the try except logs, you know, mixed with my code. But sometimes you have no choice, and you have to have them there. So yes, I, I I'm thinking about that because that that will be a, a killer feature. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, thank you. <laughs>